Chapter 2 of A German Deserter's War Experience by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Fighting in Belgium. About ten minutes we might have lain in the grass when we suddenly heard rifle shots in front of us. Electrified, all of us jumped up and hastened to our rifles. Then the firing of rifles that was going on at a distance of about a mile or a mile and a half began steadily to increase in volume. We set in motion immediately. The expression and the behavior of the soldiers betrayed that something was agitating their mind, that an emotion had taken possession of them which they could not master and had never experienced before. On myself I could observe a great restlessness. Fear and curiosity threw my thoughts into a wild jumble. My head was swimming, and everything seemed to press upon my heart. But I wished to conceal my fears from my comrades. I know I tried to do with a will, but whether I succeeded better than my comrades, whose uneasiness I could read in their faces, I doubt very much. Though I was aware that we should be in the firing line within half an hour, I endeavored to convince myself that our participation in the fight would no longer be necessary. I clung obstinately, nay, almost convulsively, to every idea that could strengthen that hope or give me consolation, that not every bullet finds its billet, that, as we have been told, most wounds in modern wars were afflicted by grazing shots which caused slight flesh wounds. Those were some of the reiterated self-deceptions indulged in against my better knowledge, and they proved effective. It was not only that they made me in fact feel more easy, Deeply engaged in those thoughts, I had scarcely observed that we were already quite near the firing line. The bicycles at the side of the road revealed to us that the cyclist corps were engaged by the enemy. We did not know, of course, the strength of our opponents as we approached the firing line in leaps. In leaping forward, everyone bent down instinctively, while to our right and left and behind us the enemy's bullets could be heard striking. Yet we reached the firing line without any casualties and were heartily welcomed by our hard-pressed friends. The cyclists, too, had not yet suffered any losses. Some, it is true, had already been slightly wounded, but they could continue to participate in the fight. We were lying flat on the ground and fired in the direction indicated to us as fast as our rifles would allow. So far, we had not seen our opponents. That, it seemed, was too little interesting to some of our soldiers, so they rose partly and fired in a kneeling position. Two men of my company had to pay their curiosity with their lives. Almost at one and the same time, they were shot through the head. The first victim of our group fell down forward without uttering a sound. The second threw up his arms and fell on his back. Both of them were dead instantly. Who could describe the feelings that overcome a man in the first real hail of bullets he is in? When we were leaping forward to reach the firing line, I felt no longer any fear and seemed only to try to reach the line as quickly as possible. But when looking at the first dead man, I was seized by a terrible horror. For minutes I was perfectly stupefied, had completely lost command over myself, and was absolutely incapable to think or act. I pressed my face and hands firmly against the ground, and then, suddenly, I was seized by an irrepressible excitement, took hold of my gun and began to fire away blindly. Little after little, I quieted down again somewhat. Nay, I became almost quite confident, as if everything was normal. Suddenly, I found myself content with myself and my surroundings, and when a little later the whole line was commanded, Leap forward! March! March! I ran forward, demented like the others, as if things could not be other than what they were. The order, Position! followed and we flopped down like wet bags. Firing had begun again. Our firing became more lively from minute to minute, and grew into a rolling, deafening noise. If in such an infernal noise you want to make yourself understood by your neighbor, you have to shout at him so that it hurts your throat. The effect of our firing caused our opponent to grow unsteady. His fire became weaker. The line of the enemy began to waver. Being separated from the enemy by only about 500 yards, we could observe exactly what was happening there. We saw how about half of the men opposing us were drawn back. The movement is executed by taking back every second man while number one stays on until the retiring party has halted. We took advantage of that movement to inflict the severest losses possible on our retreating opponent. As far as we could survey the country to our right and left, we observed that the Germans were pressing forward at several points. 
Our company, too, received the order to advance when the enemy took back all his forces. Our task was to cling obstinately to the heels of the retreating enemy, so as to leave him no time to collect his forces and occupy new positions. We therefore followed him in leaps with short breathing pauses, so as to prevent him in the first place from establishing himself in the village before him. We should have to engage in costly street fighting. But the Belgians did not attempt to establish themselves, but disengaged themselves from us with astonishing skill. Meanwhile, we had been reinforced. Our company had been somewhat dispersed, and everybody marched with the troop he chanced to find himself with. My troop had to stay in the village to search every house systematically for soldiers that had been dispersed or hidden. During that work, we noticed that the Germans were marching forward from all directions. Field artillery, machine gun sections, etc., arrived, and all of us wondered whence all of this came so quickly. There was, however, no time for long reflections. With fixed bayonets, we went from house to house, from door to door, and though the harvest was very meager, we were not turned away quite empty-handed, as the inhabitants had to deliver up all privately owned firearms, ammunition, etc. The chief functionary of the village who accompanied us had to explain to every citizen that the finding of arms after the search would lead to punishment by court-martial, and court-martial means death. After another hour had passed, we were alarmed again by rifle and gun firing. A new battle had begun. Whether the artillery was in action on both sides could not be determined from the village, but the noise was loud enough, for the air was almost trembling with the rumbling, rolling, and growling of the guns, which steadily increased in strength. The ambulance columns were bringing in the first wounded. Orderly officers whizzed past us. War had begun with full intensity. Darkness was falling before we had finished searching all the houses. We dragged mattresses, sacks of straw, feather beds, whatever we could get a hold of, to the public school and the church where the wounded were to be accommodated. They were put to bed as well as it could be done. Those first victims of the horrible massacre of nations were treated with touching care. Later on, when we had grown more accustomed to those horrible sights, less attention was paid to the wounded. The first fugitives now arrived from the neighboring villages. They had probably walked for many an hour, for they looked tired, absolutely exhausted. There were women, old, white-haired men, and children, all mixed together, who had not been able to save anything but their poor lives. In a perambulator or a push-cart, those unfortunate beings carried away all that the brutal force of war had left them. In marked contrast to the fugitives that we had hitherto met, these people were filled with the utmost fear, shivering with fright, terror-stricken in face of the hostile world. As soon as they beheld one of us soldiers, they were seized with such a fear that they seemed to crumple up. How different they were from the inhabitants of the village in which we were, who showed themselves kind, friendly, and even obliging toward us. We tried to find out the cause of that fear, and heard that those fugitives had witnessed bitter street fighting in their village. They had experienced war, had seen their houses burnt, their simple belongings perish, and had not yet been able to forget their streets filled with dead and wounded soldiers. It became clear to us that it was not fear alone that made these people look like the hunted quarry. It was hatred, hatred against us, the invaders who, as they had to suppose, had fallen upon them unawares, had driven them from their home. But their hatred was not only directed against us, the German soldiers, nay, their own, the Belgian soldiers, too, were not spared by it. We marched away that very evening and tried to reach our section. When darkness fell, the Belgians had concentrated still farther to the rear. They were already quite near the fortress of Liege. Many of the villages we passed were in flames. The inhabitants who had been driven away passed us in crowds. There were women whose husbands were perhaps also defending their fatherland. Children, old men, who were pushed hither and thither and seemed to be always in the way. Without any aim, any plan, any place in which they could rest, those processions of misery and unhappiness crept past us, the best illustration of man-murdering, nation-destroying war. Again we reached a village which to all appearances had once been inhabited by a well-to-do people, by a contented little humanity. There were nothing but ruins now, burnt, destroyed houses and farm buildings, dead soldiers, German and Belgian, and among them several civilians who had been shot by sentence of the court-martial. 
Towards midnight, we reached the German line, which was trying to get possession of a village which was already within the fortifications of Liege, and was obstinately defended by the Belgians. Here we had to employ all our forces to wrench from our opponent house after house, street after street. It was not yet completely dark, so that we had to go through that terrible struggle which developed with all our senses awake and receptive. It was a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Every kind of weapon had to be employed. The opponent was attacked with the butt-end of the rifle, the knife, the fist, and the teeth. One of my best friends fought with a gigantic Belgian. Both had lost their rifle. They were pummeling each other with their fists. I had just finished with a Belgian who was about twenty-two years of age, and was going to assist my friend, as the Herculean Belgian was so much stronger than he. Suddenly my friend succeeded with a lightning motion in biting the Belgian on the chin. He bit so deep that he tore away a piece of flesh with his teeth. The pain the Belgian felt must have been immense, for he let go his hold and ran off screaming with terrible pain. All that happened in seconds. The blood of the Belgian ran out of my friend's mouth. He was seized by a horrible nausea, an indescribable terror. The taste of the warm blood nearly drove him insane. That young, gay, lively fellow of twenty-four had been cheated out of his youth in that night. He used to be the jolliest among us. After that, we could never induce him even to smile. While fighting during the night, I came for the first time in touch with the butt-end of a Belgian rifle. I had a hand-to-hand -hand fight with a Belgian when another one from behind hit me with his rifle on the head with such force that it drove my head into the helmet up to my ears. I experienced a terrific pain all over my head, doubled up, and lost consciousness. When I revived, I found myself with a bandaged head in a barn among other wounded. I had not been severely wounded, but I felt as if my head was double its normal size, and there was a noise in my ears as of the wheels of an express engine. The other wounded and the soldiers of the ambulance corps said that the Belgians had been pushed back to the fortress. We heard, however, that severe fighting was still going on. Wounded soldiers were being brought in continuously, and they told us that the Germans had already taken in the first assault several fortifications like outer forts, but that they had not been able to maintain themselves because they had not been sufficiently provided with artillery. The defended places and works inside the forts were still practically completely intact, and so were their garrisons. The forts were not yet ripe for assault, so that the Germans had to retreat with downright enormous losses. The various reports were contradictory, and it was impossible to get a clear idea of what was happening. Meanwhile, the artillery had begun to bombard the fortress, and even the German soldiers were terror-stricken at that bombardment. The heaviest artillery was brought into action against the modern forts of concrete. Up to that time, no soldier had been aware of the existence of the 42-centimeter mortars. Even when Liege had fallen into German hands, we soldiers could not explain to ourselves how it was possible that those enormous fortifications, constructed partly of reinforced concrete of a thickness of one to six meters, could be turned into a heap of rubbish after only a few hours' bombardment. Having been wounded, I could, of course, not taken part in those operations, but my comrades told me later on how the various forts were taken. Guns of all sizes were turned on the forts, but it was the 21 and 42 centimeter mortars that really did the work. From afar one could hear already the approach of the 42 centimeter shell. The shell bored its way through the air with an uncanny rushing and hissing sound that was like a long shrill whistling filling the whole atmosphere for seconds. Where it struck everything was destroyed within a radius of several hundred yards. Later, I have often gazed in wonderment at those hecatombs which the 42-centimeter mortar erected for itself on all its journeys. The enormous air pressure caused by the bursting of its shells made it even difficult for us Germans in the most advanced positions to breathe for several seconds. To complete the infernal row, the zeppelins appeared at night in order to take part in the work of destruction. Suddenly, the soldiers would hear above their heads the whirring of the propellers and the noise of the motors, well known to most Germans. The zeppelins came nearer and nearer, but not until they were in the immediate neighborhood of the forts were they discovered by our opponents, who immediately brought all available searchlights into play in order to search the sky for the dreaded flying enemies. The whirring of the propellers of the airships, which had been distributed for work on the various forts, suddenly ceased. 
Then, right up in the air, a blinding light appeared, the searchlight of the Zeppelin, which lit up the country beneath it for a short time. Just as suddenly it became dark and quiet until a few minutes later, powerful detonations brought the news that the Zeppelin had dropped its ballast. That continued for quite a while, explosion following explosion, interrupted only by small fiery clouds, shrapnel which the Belgian artillery sent up to the airships, exploding in the air. Then the whirring of the propellers began again, first loud and coming from near, from right above our heads, then softer and softer, until the immense ship of the air had entirely disappeared from our view and hearing. Thus the forts were made level with the ground. Thousands of Belgians were lying dead and buried behind and beneath the ramparts and fortifications. General assault followed. Liege was in the hands of the Germans. I was with the ambulance column until the 9th of August, and by that time had been restored sufficiently to rejoin my section of the army. After searching for hours, I found my company camping in a field. I missed many a good friend. My section had lost sixty-five men, dead and wounded, though it had not taken part in the pursuit of the enemy. We had been attached to the newly formed 18th Reserve Army Corps, Hessians, and belonged to the 4th Army, which was under the command of Duke Albrecht of Württemberg, where that army, which had not yet been formed, was to operate, was quite unknown to us private soldiers. We had but to follow to the place where the herd was to be slaughtered. What did it matter where that would be? On the 11th of August we began to march and covered 25 to 45 miles every day. We learned later on that we always kept close to the Luxembourg frontier so as to cross it immediately should necessity arise. Had it not been so oppressively hot, we should have been quite content, for we enjoyed several days of rest which braced us up again. On the 21st of August, we came in contact with the first German troops belonging to the 4th Army, about 15 miles to the east of the Belgian town of Neufchateau. The Battle of Neufchateau, which lasted from the 22nd to the 24th of August, had already begun. The French army here met with the 4th German Army, and a murderous slaughter began. As is always the case, it commenced with small skirmishes of advance guards and patrols, Little after little, ever-growing masses of soldiers took part, and when, in the evening of the 22nd of August, we were led into the firing line, the battle had already developed to one of the most murderous of the world war. When we arrived, the French were still in possession of nearly three-quarters of the town. The artillery had set fire to the greatest part of Neufchateau, and only the splendid villas in the western part of the town escaped destruction for the time being. The street fighting lasted the whole night. It was only towards noon of the 23rd of August, when the town was in the hands of the Germans, that one could see the enormous losses that both sides had suffered. The dwelling places, the cellars, the roads and sidewalks were thickly covered with dead and horribly wounded soldiers. The houses were ruins, gutted, empty shells, in which scarcely anything of real value had remained whole. Thousands had been made beggars in a night full of horrors. Women and children, soldiers and citizens, were lying just where death had struck them down, mixed together just as the merciless shrapnel and shells had sent them out of life into the darkness beyond. There had been real impartiality. There lay a German soldier next to a white-haired French woman, a little Belgian stripling whom fear had driven out of the house into the street, lay huddled up against the enemy, a German soldier, who might have been protection and safety for him. Had we not been shooting and stabbing, murdering and clubbing as much and as vigorously as we could the whole night? And yet there was scarcely one among us who did not shed tears of grief and emotion at the spectacles presenting themselves. There was, for instance, a man whose age it was difficult to discover. He was lying dead before a burning house. Both his legs had burned up to the knees by the fire falling down upon him. The wife and daughter of the dead man were clinging to him, and were sobbing so piteously that one simply could not bear it. Many, many of the dead had been burnt entirely or partly. The cattle were burning in their stables, and the wild bellowing of those animals, fighting against death by fire, intermingled with the crying, the moaning, and the groaning, and the shrieking of the wounded. But who had the time now to bother about that? Everybody wanted to help. Everybody wanted to help himself. Everybody was only thinking of himself and his little bit of life. He who falls remains where he lies. Only he who stands can win victories. That one learns from militarism, and the average soldier acts upon that principle. 
and yet most soldiers are forced by circumstances to play the role of the Good Samaritan. People who could formerly not look upon blood or a dead person were now bandaging their comrades' arms and legs, which had been amputated by shells. They did not do it because they were impelled by the command of their heart, but because they said to themselves that perhaps tomorrow already their turn might come, and that they, too, might want assistance. It is a healthy egotism which makes men of mercy out of those hardened people. The French had formed their lines again outside the town in the open. At the moment when the enemy evacuated the town, an error was made by the Germans, which cost many hundreds of German soldiers their lives. The Germans had occupied the rest of the town with such celerity that our artillery which was pounding that quarter had not been informed of the changed situation, and was raining shell upon shell into our own ranks. That failure of our intelligence department caused the death of many of our comrades. Compelled by the firing of the enemy and our own artillery, we had finally to give up part of our gains, which later on we recovered, again with great sacrifice. Curiously enough, the residential quarter with the villas I mentioned before had not suffered seriously. The Red Cross flag was hoisted on the houses in which temporary hospitals were established. It is here that the Belgian citizens are said to have mutilated some German wounded soldiers. Whether it was true, whether it was only rumored, as was asserted also many times by German soldiers who had been in the hospitals, I do not know. But this I know, that on the 24th of August, when the French had executed a general retreat, it was made known in an army order that German soldiers had been murdered there, and that the German army could not leave the scenes of those shameful deeds without having first avenged their poor comrades. The order was therefore given, by the leader of the army, to raise the town without mercy. When later on, it was in the evening and we were pursuing the enemy, we were resting for a short time. Clouds of smoke in the east showed that the judgment had been fulfilled. A battery of artillery that had remained behind had raised house after house. Revenge is sweet, also for Christian army leaders. Outside the town, the French had reformed their ranks, and were offering the utmost resistance. But they were no match for the German troops, who consisted largely of young and active men. Frenchmen taken prisoner explained that it was simply impossible to withstand an assault of this war machine. When the German columns attacked with the bayonet, and the cry of hurrah, hurrah, which penetrated to the very marrow. I can understand that, for we sometimes appeared to ourselves to be a good imitation of American Indians who, like us, rushed upon their enemies with shrill shouts. After a fight lasting three hours, many Frenchmen surrendered, asking for quarter with raised hands. Whole battalions of the enemy were thus captured by us. Finally, in the night from the 23rd to the 24th of August, the ranks of the enemy were thrown into confusion and retreated, first slowly, then flying headlong. Our opponent left whole batteries, munition columns, ambulance columns, etc. I found myself in the first pursuing section. The roads we used were again literally covered with corpses, knapsacks, rifles, dead horses, and men were lying there in a wild jumble. The dead had been partly crushed and pounded to a pulp by the horses and vehicles, an indescribably terrible spectacle even for the most hardened mass murderer. Dead and wounded were lying to the right and left of the road, in fields, in ditches, the red trousers of the French stood out distinctly against the ground. The field gray trousers of the Germans were, however, scarcely to be noticed, and difficult to discover. The distance between ourselves and the fleeing Frenchmen became greater and greater, and the spirit of our soldiers, in spite of the hardships they had undergone, became better and gayer. They joked and sang, forgot the corpses which were still filling the roads and paths, and felt quite at ease. They had already accustomed themselves to the horrible to such a degree that they stepped over the corpses with unconcern, without even making the smallest detour. The experience of those first few weeks of the war had already brutalized us completely. What was to happen to us if this should continue for months? End of chapter 2